Hello, and welcome to the second quarter earnings conference call for Amphenol Corporation. Following today's presentation, there will be a formal question and answer session. Until then, all lines will remain in a listen-only mode. At the request of the company, today's conference is being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to introduce today's conference host, Mr. Craig Lampo. Sir, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Craig Lampo, Amphenol CFO, and I'm here together with Adam Norwood, our CEO. We would like to welcome you to our second quarter 2024 conference call. Our second quarter 2024 results were released this morning. I will provide some financial commentary and then Adam will give an overview of the business and current market trends, and then we will take questions. As a reminder, during the call, we may refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures and make certain forward-looking statements. So please refer to the relevant disclosures in our press release for further information. In addition, as a result of our recently announced two-for-one stock split effective on June 11th of 2024, all share and per share data discussed on this earnings call is on a split adjusted basis. The company closed the second quarter with record sales of $3 billion, $610 million and gap in, in record adjusted diluted EPS of 41 and 44 cents respectively. Second quarter sales were up 18% in U.S. dollars, 19% in local currencies, and 11% organically compared to the second quarter of 2023. Sequentially, sales were up 11% in U.S. dollars and in local currencies, and up 8% organically. Adam will comment further on trends by market in a few minutes. Orders in the quarter were a record $4 billion, $61 million, up 33% to the prior year, and up 21% sequentially, resulting in a strong book-to-bill ratio of 1.12 to 1. GAAP operating income and operating margin were $699 million and 19.4% respectively, which included $70 million of acquisition-related costs primarily associated with the CIT acquisition. Excluding these costs, adjusted operating income was $769 million, resulting in record adjusted operating margin of 21.3% in the second quarter of 24. On an adjusted basis, operating margin increased by 90 basis points from the prior year quarter and 30 basis points sequentially. The year-over-year -year increase in adjusted operating margin was primarily driven by strong operating leverage on higher sales volumes, which was partially offset by the dilutive impact of acquisitions completed in the prior 12 months. On a sequential basis, the modest increase in adjusted operating margin reflected strong conversion on the higher sales levels, partially offset by the dilutive impact of acquisitions made in the second quarter, particularly CIT, which is currently operating well below the company's average profitability levels. We are very proud of the company's operating margin performance in the second quarter, which reflects continued strong execution by our teams. Breaking down second quarter results by segment compared to the second quarter of 23, sales in the harsh environment solution segment were 1 billion 46 million and increased by 18% in US dollars and 1% organically and segment operating margin was 24.8%. Sales in the communication solution segment were 1 billion 445 million dollars and increased by 24% in US dollars and 23% organically. Segment operating margin was 24.3%. Sales in the interconnect and sensor system segment were $1,119 billion and increased by 12% in U.S. dollars and 7% organically, and segment operating margin was 18.2%. The company's gap effective tax rate for the second quarter of 20 was 20.4%, and the adjusted effective tax rate was 24%, which compared to 21.9% and 24% in the second quarter of 23, respectively. We continue to expect our adjusted effective tax rate to be at 24% in the third quarter and for the full year of 24. Gap adjusted EPS was 41 cents in the second quarter, up 11% compared to the prior year period. And on an adjusted basis, the looted EPS increased 22% to a record 44 cents compared to 36 cents in the second quarter of 23. Operating cash flow in the second quarter was $664 million, or 120% of adjusted net income. And net of capital spending, our free cash flow, was $528 million, or 95% of adjusted net income. 
We are pleased to have continued to deliver a strong cash flow yield in, in the quarter despite our slightly increased levels of CapEx. I would note that while our second quarter capital spending was higher than the first quarter, it was still within our normal range. We continue to expect somewhat elevated levels of capital spending in the coming couple of quarters as we invest to support the growth we are seeing in the defense and IT data com markets. From a working capital standpoint, inventory days, days sales outstanding, and payable days were 84, 69, and 56 days respectively, all within normal levels. During the quarter, the company repurchased 3.1 million shares of common stock at an average price of approximately $62. When combined with our normal quarterly dividend, total capital return to shareholders in the second quarter of 2024 was more than $320 million. Total debt on June 30th was $5.4 billion and net debt was $4.1 billion. And total liquidity at the end of the quarter was $4.3 billion, which included cash and short term investments on hand of $1.3 billion, plus availability under our existing credit facilities. Excluding acquisition related costs, second quarter 2024 EBITDA was $900 million. And at the end of the second quarter of 2024, our net leverage ratio was 1.2 times. As a result of the $1.5 billion U.S. bond offerings completed earlier in the second quarter and the subsequent closing of CIT in May, we expect quarterly interest expense, net of interest income earned on cash on hand, to be approximately $45 million in the third quarter. The company is in a very strong financial position, and we continue to be well positioned to, to fund future opportunities as they arise. In particular, we are well positioned to fund the pending acquisition of the own and DAS businesses of Comscope for a purchase price of $2.1 billion, which we expect to close by the end of the first half of 2025. We will fund this acquisition through cash on hand and debt. Finally, as mentioned in today's earnings release, the company's board of directors has approved a 50% increase in the company's quarterly dividend to 16.5 cents per share effective for payments beginning in October of 2024. I will now turn it over to Adam, who will provide some commentary on current market trends. Well, thank you very much, Craig, and I'd like to extend my welcome to all of you here on the phone today, and I hope that you and your family, friends, and colleagues are enjoying a, a very nice summer so far. Uh, as Craig mentioned, I'm going to highlight a few of our achievements in the second quarter. I will spend a few moments to review our recently closed and announced acquisitions. I'll talk about our trends and progress across our serve markets, and then we'll make some comments on our outlook for the third quarter. And of course, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Our results in the second quarter were stronger than expected, exceeding the high end of our guidance in sales and adjusted diluted earnings per share. Sales grew from prior year by 18% in U.S. dollars and 19% in local currencies, reaching a new record $3,610,000,000. On an organic basis, sales increased by a strong 11%, with growth in IT datacom, defense, commercial air, mobile networks, mobile devices, and automotive, only slightly offset by moderations in the broadband and industrial markets. Importantly, the company booked record orders of $4 billion, million, representing a robust book-to-bill of 1.12 to 1. I would just note here that our bookings were particularly strong from IT Datacom customers focused on artificial intelligence or AI. Adjusted operating margins reached a record 21.3% in the second quarter, a strong 90 basis point increase from last year's second quarter. And adjusted diluted EPS grew 22% from prior year to a record 44 cents. Uh, we also generated strong operating and free cash flow in the quarter of 664 million and 528 million respectively, both clear demonstrations of the high quality of the company's earnings. And finally, as Craig mentioned, we announced this morning a 50% increase in the company's quarterly dividend to 16 and a half cents per share effective with our October dividend payment. Just wanna say how proud I am of our team here this quarter as, as the results that they drove once again reflect the strength of our entrepreneurial organization as we continue to perform well amidst a very dynamic environment. As you know, our M&A team has, has once again been very busy of late. 
I'm very pleased to announce that on May 21st, we closed the previously announced acquisition of CIT, previously called Carlisle Interconnect Technologies. I'm very excited to welcome the talented CIT team to the Amphenol family, and we really look forward to realizing the benefits of the combined breadth of our company's highly complementary product solutions which will enable us to offer our customers an expanded array of innovative technologies across the important commercial air, defense, and industrial markets. In addition, we're pleased to have signed a definitive agreement to acquire Lutze. Lutze is a leading provider of harsh environment cable and cable assembly solutions for high technology applications in the industrial markets. This acquisition includes two businesses, Lutze US, based in North Carolina, and Lutze Europe, based in Germany. In May, we did close on the acquisition of Lutze US, which has annual sales of approximately $75 million. And we expect to close on Lutze Europe, which has annual sales of approximately $100 million by the end of the third quarter of 2024. That's this quarter here. The Lutze acquisition is a great complement to our broad offering of high technology interconnect products for the worldwide industrial market and in particular strengthens our range of value-add interconnect products. Finally, just last week, we announced an agreement to acquire the mobile networks-related businesses of Comscope for a purchase price of $2.1 billion. We're really excited to be acquiring Comscope's Outdoor Wireless Networks, or OWN, and Distributed Antenna Systems, or DAS, businesses. These businesses provide exciting mobile network solutions with advanced technologies in the areas of base station antennas and related interconnect solutions, as well as distributed antenna systems. I just wanna mention that we're especially encouraged that the businesses that we're acquiring really make up the former Andrew Corporation portfolio of products, a company with a rich history of innovation and technology in the wireless industry. These business are, businesses are expected to generate revenues of approximately $1.2 billion with EBITDA margins of approximately 25% in 2024. Um, this represents operating margins in the high teens, including our current estimate of post-acquisition related amortization. We really look forward to supporting customers who are developing next generation wireless networks around the world with these advanced solutions, as well as with our own existing complementary interconnect products. Most importantly, we look forward to welcoming the approximately 4,000 employees of these businesses around the world. There's no doubt in my mind that these talented individuals will make great future Amphenolians. As we welcome these outstanding new teams to Amphenol, and we look forward to the future closings of Lutz Europe and Comscope ON, OWN and DAS, we remain confident that Amphenol's acquisition program will continue to create great value for the company. Our ability to identify and execute upon acquisitions and to successfully bring these new companies into Amphenol remains a core competitive advantage for the company. Now, turning to our trends across our serve markets, I would just comment that we're very pleased that the company's end market exposure remains highly diversified, balanced, and broad. This diversification continues to create great value for Amphenol, enabling, enabling us to participate across all areas of the global electronics industry while not being disproportionately exposed to the risks associated with any given market or application. So with that said, the defense market represented 11% of our sales in the quarter. Sales in this market grew from prior year by a strong 14% in US dollars and 10% organically driven by broad-based growth across most segments within the defense market. Sequentially, our sales increased by 9%, which was a bit better than our expectations coming into the quarter, driven in part by the earlier than anticipated closing of CIT. Looking into the third quarter, we expect sales to increase in the mid-single digit range from these second quarter levels, including the benefit of acquisitions. And we remain encouraged by the company's strengthened position in the defense market, where we continue to offer the industry's widest range of high technology interconnect products. Amidst today's highly dynamic geopolitical environment, countries around the world are expanding their investments in both current and next generation defense technologies, thereby increasing the long-term demand potential for Amphenol. 
With the addition now of CIT's highly complementary products to our portfolio, we're better positioned than ever to support our customers with new products and the capacity to supply them wherever they may be needed. The commercial aerospace market represented 5% of our sales in the quarter. We had another strong quarter with sales increasing by a robust 60% in US dollars and 9% organically from prior year. As we benefited from the addition of CIT during the quarter, as well as continued progress in expanding our content on next generation commercial aircraft. Sequentially, our sales grew by 46% in US dollars from the first quarter as we benefited from the addition of CIT. On an organic basis, our sales were flat sequentially, which was a bit better than we had anticipated coming into the quarter. Looking into the third quarter, we expect sales to increase in the mid 40% range as we benefit particularly from a full quarter of CIT sales. I'm truly proud of our team working in the commercial air market. Now with the addition of CIT, we offer the broadest range of high technology interconnect products to our customers in this important area. With the ongoing growth in travel and thus the demand for jetliners, our efforts to strengthen our product offering while diversifying our market position into next generation aircraft are paying real dividends. We continue to see great long-term opportunities for expansion of our technology offering to this important market and look forward to realizing the benefits of our growth initiatives for many years to come. The industrial market represented 24% of our sales in the quarter um, and sales in the second quarter did grow 9% in US dollars from prior year as we benefited from acquisitions. On an organic basis, sales declined by 5% as we saw moderations in most segments on a year-over-year -year basis of, of the industrial market. Sequentially, sales grew by a better than expected 7% from the first quarter, driven primarily by acquisitions, uh, but our organic sales were up slightly on a sequential basis. Looking in the third quarter, we expect sales to grow in the mid-single-digit range sequentially, driven by the benefit of our recent acquisitions. While the industrial market certainly has been experiencing a pause as customers and distributors have adjusted their demand levels, we are encouraged to see some early signs of momentum growing in certain areas of the industrial market. In addition, with the additions this quarter of CIT and LUTSA US, we now have an ever broadened an even broader range of products and capabilities to offer customers across the diversified industrial market. I'm confident that our long-term strategy to expand our high technology interconnect antenna and sensor offerings, both organically and through complementary acquisitions, has positioned us to capitalize on the many electronic revolutions that will no doubt continue to occur across the industrial market. This creates opportunities long-term for our outstanding team working in this market. The automotive market represented 21% of our sales in the quarter, and sales grew 6% in US dollars and 5% organically, driven by strength across newer automotive applications. Sequentially, our sales moderated by 4% from the first quarter, which was in line with our expectations coming into the quarter. I, I would note that we did see some incremental softening of demand in Europe in the quarter, as vehicle manufacturers there moderated their production volumes, and, and that was offset uh, by more favorable performance in North America and Asia. For the third quarter, we do expect sales to be slightly down from these levels as certain automakers have slowed their summer production schedules. I'm truly proud of our team working in the automotive market. Our continued outperformance is yet another confirmation of the benefit of our team's focus on driving new design wins with customers who are implementing a wide array of new technologies into their vehicles. And this includes electrified drivetrains as well as a multitude of other exciting applications. We look forward to benefiting from our strong position in the automotive market for many years to come. The mobile devices market represented 8% of our sales in the quarter and sales grew by 6% in US dollars and 7% organically as strength in smartphones and wearables more than offset moderations in sales related to laptops. Sequentially, our sales increased by 9%, which was much better than our expectations for a mid-single-digit decline 
And, and we really did see sequential growth across all segments of the mobile devices market, which was encouraging. Looking into the third quarter, we anticipate sales to increase by approximately 20% from these second quarter levels as customers prepare for year-end new product launches. While mobile devices will always remain Amphenol's most volatile of end markets, our outstanding and agile team remains well positioned to capture any opportunities for incremental sales that may arise in 2024 and beyond. Our leading array of antennas, interconnect products and mechanisms continues to enable a broad range of next generation mobile devices, thereby positioning us well for the long term. The mobile networks market represented 4% of our sales in the quarter and sales grew by 13% in US dollars and 7% organically, as we did see the beginning of a recovery in our sales to network operators and wireless equipment manufacturers after a number of quarters of demand moderation. Sequentially, sales in the quarter increased by a strong 22%, which was much better than our expectations coming into the quarter. Looking to the third quarter, we do expect some moderation from these strong second quarter levels on traditional summer seasonality. We're encouraged by the recent strengthening in the mobile networks market. As operators ramp up their investments in next generation systems, our team remains focused on realizing the benefits of our long-term efforts to expand our position in next generation equipment and networks around the world. Now with the pending acquisition of the OWN and DAS businesses from Comscope, we look forward to participating even more strongly in these next generation networks for years to come. The IT Datacom market represented 24% of our sales in the quarter. Sales in the second quarter grew by a very strong 57% in US dollars and 56% organically, driven by the continued acceleration in demand for our products used in next generation AI data centers. While the vast majority of this growth did result from our expanding position in AI Interconnect, we were encouraged to also see some improvements in base IT datacom demand. On a sequential basis, sales increased by a strong 29% from the first quarter, substantially better than our expectations coming into Q2. Looking into the third quarter, we expect sales to grow modestly from these elevated second quarter levels. We're more encouraged than ever by the company's position in the global IT datacom market. Our team continues to do an outstanding job securing future business on next generation IT systems particularly those enabling AI. Indeed, the revolution in AI has created a unique opportunity for Amphenol, given our leading high-speed and power interconnect products. With machine learning driving a more intensive usage of these highest technology of interconnect products, we're very well positioned for the future. And whether high-speed power or fiber optic interconnect, our products are critical components in these next generation networks. And this creates a continued long-term growth opportunity for Amphenol. Finally, the broadband market represented 3% of our sales in the quarter, and sales did decline by 17% in US dollars and organically from prior year, as broadband operators continued to reduce their, their procurement levels. On a sequential basis, sales were flat as we had anticipated, and looking into the third quarter, we expect a further moderation of sales sequentially. Regardless of this current muted demand environment, we do remain encouraged by the company's continued strong position in the broadband market. And we look forward to continuing to support our service provider customers around the world as they eventually increase their spending to increase network coverage and bandwidth in support of the proliferation of high-speed data applications to homes and businesses. <clears throat> now turning to our outlook, and assuming the continuation of current market conditions, as well as constant currency exchange rates. For the third quarter, we expect sales in the range of 3.7 billion to 3.8 billion, and adjusted diluted EPS in the range of 43 cents to 45 cents. This would represent sales growth of 16 to 19%, and adjusted diluted EPS growth of 10 to 15%, compared to the third quarter of 2023. As is our usual practice, this guidance does not include acquisitions which have not yet closed, 
but does include CIT and LUTSI US, both of which are currently operating below the corporate average level of profitability. I remain confident in the ability of our outstanding management team to adapt to the many opportunities and challenges in the current environment while continuing to grow Amphenol's market position and driving sustainable and strong profitability over the long term. And finally, I just want to take this opportunity here to thank our entire global team for what were truly outstanding efforts here in the second quarter. And with that, operator, we'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. The question and answer period will now begin. Please limit to one question per caller. Our first question is from Wamzi Mohan with Bank of America. You may go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, Adam, really impressive order growth over here, big, big numbers. Um, can you just talk about how much of that was, was driven by AI? Are you seeing a lot of new programs kick in, and how do we square that with your expectation of, of a moderate increase here in, in IT data comp for the third quarter? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, um, Wamsi. Look, we were very encouraged by the orders this quarter, and as I mentioned, you know, our 112 book to bill, the far and away the biggest driver of that was a very significant book to bill that we saw in, in, in the IT data comm market. Um, and, and no doubt about it, I mean, there's a significant portion of that uh, that is being driven by AI, and, and this is existing programs that we've already won, new programs that we are winning, um, a, a really broad array of, uh, a, a, of momentum that we have across AI. And I think I'm just so proud of our team who, who is leveraging our, our leading position in high speed and, and power to, to really continuing to win in these extraordinarily complex systems. And, and you know, as it relates to your question on the third quarter and, and, and the guide related to our sales, we shouldn't forget, the, these are some of the most complex interconnect products ever built um, that, that we are making in, in many cases. And they have to be that because what, what our end customers are trying to achieve with AI is really phenomenal. I mean, the phenomenal array of, of, uh, of growth of, of these next generation models that are being trained, um, the intensity of the interconnect, the requirements of both speed, high, ultra high speed, ultra low latency, the, the complexity of these systems, because you're effectively having to connect every GPU or TPU or whatever it may be to every other one in order to create this sort of fabric-like network. There is an enormous amount of technology involved in these things, and and we've talked about also in the past that for some of these uh, the, these systems, it requires also uh, some meaningfully meaningful investments up front. And and you know while our capex last quarter was was kind of you know in line with our normal historical, I think Craig did mention that we we continue to expect some elevated capex you know here in the second half. And so I would say that the orders that we're getting from customers in many ways, they have slightly opened the order aperture to maybe give us more confidence in, in, in kind of extending ourselves in, in those investments. Um, and, and as well, in order to make sure that you know, this, these significant new products with all the challenges associated with them, uh, you know, that, that we're building the right capacities in, in order to do that. And I'm not talking about massive extensions in these order apertures, but these are not necessarily just orders for the next quarter alone. Um, and so, you know, as we look at our order book, we look at our backlog related to AI, I mean, it gives us confidence not just for the quarter ahead, but for, for a long term to come. Thank you. Our next question is from Amit Darianani with Evercore. You may go ahead. <laughs> Um, yep. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I guess I'll stick to the AI team. Um, you know, Adam, maybe there's obviously a lot of focus on, you know, what does the AI opportunity opportunity really mean for Amphenol? Uh, so I'm wondering if we could spend some time just framing on how do you see this opportunity playing out for you? Is it bigger with hyperscalers or with semiconductor companies for you? And is there a way to think about maybe how much of the incremental, let's say, 300 million revenues you had in June was AI driven versus not? Thank you. Thank you very much, Amit. I mean, look, the answer is all of the above. I mean, at the end of the day, 
there are folks who are spending money to build AI data centers. And, you know, those, those tend to be way down to the chip companies. And I think what's unique about AI is these systems are so much more complicated. There's so much more technology embedded in them that, in fact, we are working through the stack of, of, of that entire chain um, in, in making sure that our products are, are doing the right thing uh, at, at each level. Um, and so I think from that perspective, it's, it's a little bit unique compared to traditional IT datacom where we worked with you know, just OEMs or just service providers. I say here we work with companies up and down the stack and, and you know, in, in significant ways, let, let, let me say that. Um, in terms of the, the growth over prior year, I mean, you characterized our, our growth, which is, you know, just over $300 million on a year-over-year -year basis. And I think what I, how I described that was the vast majority of that growth really came out of AI. And, you know, we've, we've been careful not to just put specific numbers. In, in, in fact, it's not always easy to tell what is exactly AI and what is exactly not AI. And so we've tried to be a little bit more directional about those numbers. Um, and I think we've been consistent about that from really the beginning of the sort of advent of this revolution. But, but I think you can safely say it's a, the vast majority of our growth on a year-over-year -year basis. And then on a sequential basis, you know, just to give another data point, I would say that, you know, the strong majority of our growth on a sequential basis, but not all of it. And, and we were encouraged on a sequential basis uh, as well to see some growth in the base IT demand, which, which has been a long time coming. I think we all know, I mean, that was not the easiest of markets um, over the last, you know, I don't know, six, eight quarters. Um, and it's encouraging for us to finally see, you know, meaningful growth. From, from that sort of base IT investments, which we always expected would, would one day come. But no doubt about it, you know, the vast majority of year over year, the strong majority of our sequential growth has come out of AI. Thank you. Our next question is from Samik Chatterjee with JP Morgan. You may go ahead. Oh, hi, thanks for taking my question. Adam, I'm actually going to switch gears here and ask you about um, the acquisition of Comscope, uh, particularly in terms of when you think about mobile networks, and you mentioned you're starting to see somewhat of a cyclical sort of spending recovery from your customers, but I think investor perception generally for, for that uh, mobile networks business has been that service providers don't really need to spend massively till we get to 6G. So maybe if you can sort of outline why now, why now the acquisition, how are you thinking about sort of the outlook for the next few years, and what drove sort of uh, uh, what drove the decision here to um, double down on this mobile networks business? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Samik. Um, look, I, and I'm just gonna, from a vernacular perspective, we'll we'll call this Andrew, so as not to confuse anybody, because we're not buying all of Comscope, we're buying the mobile networks business from Comscope, which is essentially Andrew that was acquired by them. In, in 2007, and Andrew is just a fabulous, fabulous company. I mean, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, a rich, a rich legacy of technology and an outstanding enabler of all the generations. I mean, they go back all the way to 1G and 2G and 3G and 4G and, and, and now 5G as a, as a core partner in enabling those next generation uh, networks. And, and I think, yes, uh, for the last, you know, year or year and a half, we've seen, you know, more muted demand in mobile networks. We're encouraged to see that now. I, I'm not going to tell you that we're smart enough to have timed exactly, you know, this announcement to exactly when we started to see that market turn. I think that's more coincidental. This is a company that we've admired for a long, long, long time. It's a fabulous organization with fabulous people, fabulous technology. So, so that that's not that it's it's that you know we saw the market turning and then we we decided to acquire it. Quite quite the contrary, you know these are these are lengthy discussions. Um, so so you know the why now I, I think is not necessarily. I, I wouldn't tell you that there is a now. It just happened that you know this was the right time for them and the right time for us in in how these discussions go. But the long term. I will say this, the long term for mobile networks is something that we do believe in as a component of the broad diversified presence that we have across the, the entire range of the electronics industry. I mean, the fact is, all these things that we're talking about, 
be they AI or next generation communications or mobile devices or whatever, you know, we are accessing these things by and large through mobile networks today, not through fixed line. And by the way, we cover fixed line. We still have our broadband business as a way to, to make sure that we're present whenever people are getting uh, internet through, through a cable or otherwise. But we've always said we want to be present in a high technology way as a partner to our customers in every way that people are accessing data. And, and over the long term, there's no doubt in my mind that the highest growth way that people are going to access data is, through, is in a disconnected fashion through mobile networks. And yes, there's 5G today where there's still a lot of work to be done to build that out. There will be a 6G, there will be a 7G, there will be an 8G. I've been, I've been in the company long enough to have watched these generations unfold, and we want to be a participant in that. Uh, you know, doubling down, I mean, sure, this is, this is going to significantly expand our position in the mobile networks market, which I would argue today is, is somewhat underrepresented, 4% of our sales uh, last quarter. But this is not doubling down for all of Amphenol in, in that respect. You know, after we make this acquisition, mobile networks may represent, you know, somewhere in the high single digits, uh, roughly, uh, of our sales. And I would also put that in the context that over the last 18 months, we've made, now we've completed 12 acquisitions uh, and we've signed two others, Lutza Europe and, and now uh, Andrew, to, to be, uh, that, that will be closing in the future. And we've made these acquisitions across the range of Amphenol uh, of the serve markets that, that we have, but in particular with the acquisition of CIT and a number of our other industrial markets, those kind of slower cycle markets uh, of commercial air, defense, uh, industrial, automotive, you know, those have been a little bit more concentrated there. And, and we do believe that having balance across the faster cycle markets and the slower cycle markets, the communications markets, being the faster ones, we think that balance is, is a very great thing for the company long term, and it allows us to continue to have great exposure to every corner of the, uh, of, uh, of the electronics market while not having overexposure and, and thereby being overly susceptible to risk uh, should there be a problem in any given market. So we think this is a great uh, strategic acquisition from a product technology perspective. It's great from a global customer relationship perspective. And, and it's great for overall Amphenol in what it brings, not to mention that the 4,000 people that, that one day will join our organization, uh, many of whom have worked for the company all the way back to the time when it was, in fact, Andrew, um, they're going to make fantastic Amphenolians in the future. Thank you. The next question is from Luke Young with Baird. You may go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Um, Adam, uh, maybe a near-term question, but, um, you know, you mentioned in your prepared remarks that, you know, of course, we've been seeing a pause in the industrial markets that you were encouraged by some early signs of momentum in, in the quarter. Could you just double-click on what you're seeing in some of those areas, be it geographically or by end market, and maybe if you could frame it up with what you're seeing in terms of orders as a leading indicator, that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Luke. Yeah, look, starting with orders, I mean, we were encouraged, actually, I think, I, I can't tell you how long it's been, but, you know, to have a positive book to bill in the industrial market, and, you know, not just like 101 to one, it was like, you know, a decently positive book to bill that we, that we had in industrial. So that, I would say, is encouraging sign number one. I would say encouraging sign number two is that we saw with our distributors in particular on a sequential basis, but, but even on a year-over-year -year basis, um, growth in demand from our distributors, the, the demand they put upon us. And, and that's a great early indication that the kind of inventory corrections that were happening at the end customer and in the distribution channel, those seem to be largely behind us. And, you know, I never want to be the guy to call a bottom, let me say that. Um, but, but I'm encouraged that we actually had you know, meaningful growth um, on a sequential basis in distribution from, from the first quarter. I mean, and when I, you know, when I say meaningful, I'm talking about, you know, you know high teens kind of growth rate uh, on a sequential basis from distribution. And that's broadly from distribution, but also from the distribution that is within in industrial. So I think those are, those are good signs. Um, if you look at our guide here for, for the third quarter, 
Um, you know, yes, we, we were kind of on a year-over-year -year basis in the second quarter organically down, but we were actually up slightly sequentially in industrial. And then, you know, our guide for the third quarter would have us be, you know, kind of flattish sequentially uh, on an organic basis. I mean, we, I talked about the fact that we will grow, but that, that growth is really driven by, uh, by the new acquisitions. Um, so, look, this is not to say that all is perfect in industrial, but I think the combination of the orders and the behavior of distributors, those are two pretty good early signs. And, you know, as we get into the third quarter, 90 days from now, and we see how that goes, you know, we'll certainly try to be able to give everybody a little bit more visibility to, to whether that is, in fact, happening. Um, the, the, the last thing I would say is you mentioned geographical. Um, th there's no doubt that the industrial trends are diverging geographically. So we actually saw organic growth in the quarter on a sequential basis in North America and Asia, and we saw continued organic declines in Europe. And, and so I think, you know, Europe is certainly not out of the woods uh, right now, um, but it's encouraging that we see this in distribution. North America has maybe a little bit more distribution than Europe does, and, and to see also the growth that, we've, that we're seeing now in Asia. Thank you. Our next question is from Asiya Merchant with Citigroup. You may go ahead. Great. Thank you for taking my question. If I could just double click on operating margins, you know, really strong here in the comm segment. Um, as you continue to see AI, uh, you know, momentum here, how should we think about both incremental operating margins going forward and just broadly EBIT margins going forward? Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks a lot for the question. Yeah, you know, listen, we're really proud, uh, you know, of the operating margins here in, in the second quarter and 21.3% record operating margins. And that's obviously including, you know, part of the quarter where we have CIT, which is, you know, well below the company average, kind of in the low double digit range. And, you know, so certainly proud of the of the operating margins. And, um, you know, you know, certainly that's driven by a, a bunch of factors, and I, I wouldn't focus it on on one particular area. I would, you know, there's a few things happening here. You know, certainly some of the markets that are growing, including the IT data market and and you know military and some others are certainly you know those businesses that continue just to be execute well on on the higher growth rates and. The other side of that coin is we have certain markets in certain businesses that are not growing and, you know, industrial we talked about a little bit and, and they're really doing a good job kind of on, on the other side of the coin to be able to kind of protect their margins. So overall, I, I wouldn't focus it on say one area, but I think, you know, as we continue to grow, as we continue to be able to drive volume, we should be able to continue to drive our margins up and, you know, into that kind of 25% or so, you know, targeted conversion margins we talk about. Clearly, CIT here in the in the third quarter, you know, sequentially is going to have a bit of an impact, and you see that in in our in our kind of implied guidance, um, you know, from a sequential perspective. But if you look, you know, if organically coming into the third quarter, we're still converting very well, um, excluding kind of the CIT impact into those margins, and uh, we feel real good about the margins and the you know expansion potential as we move forward um, here in the year. Thank you. Our next question is from Joe Spack with UBS. You may go ahead. Uh, thanks so much. I um, want to go back to Andrews. Uh, so I'm getting the, uh, the nomenclature right now. Um, the, uh, just a couple quick, quick things. One, um, the 25% EBITDA margins you sort of highlighted on, on that deal. It, I mean, again, just looking at um, some of the historicals looks a little bit higher. I just wanted to understand if you were building in any sort of synergies or, or anything else into that, or that's just a forecast. Um, and then two, I, I noticed you, in the release, you said, you know, EPS accretive X transaction costs, and I'm sure you're still going through some of the delamination and other, and other challenge, other issues, but um, it, it, you generally run that through. So is it also just straight EPS accretive? Should we expect that? Sure. Yeah, no, I think this is uh, just to start with the EPS accretion part. I, you know, we're, we haven't called that out because I think it's a little bit far into the future to start, you know, calling out EPS accretion. It certainly will be EPS accretive. It's a very, you know, it's strong profitability. Adam mentioned, you know, in his prepared remarks, this is high teens operating margin, assuming kind of the amortization we would expect 
uh, based on our current estimates, you know, post acquisition. Uh, so certainly we, we would expect, you know, the, a good, a good level of EPS accretion, you know, after, after the acquisition. Um, in regards to the 25% EBITDA, there's certainly no synergies. We're not, you know, we're not anticipating any synergies. We don't talk about synergies typically, as you know, our, our approach to when acquiring companies and bringing them into the, into the Amphenol family is we don't, we don't try to make significant changes. We kind of, you know, we essentially enable the businesses to, to expand margins while in helping them do so in, in, as part of Amphenol. Um, and that's, that will be our, our continued playbook in, in addition to, you know, as we, as we bring Comscope, we ultimately close this, the Andrews business there. So I, I wouldn't say that, you know, this 25% is, uh, that's what we view it as right now. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about, you know, uh, you know, it's still part of Comscope's business and we're not going to necessarily talk so much about, you know, kind of what their, um, what their expectations are and they're going to continue to report on this business and we'll let them do so. Thank you. Our next question is from Guy Hardwick with Freedom Capital Markets. You may go ahead. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Guy. Good afternoon, um, Guy. Just, hi. Uh, thanks, Adam, for the background on Andrew Core. Um, just a question, um, question. Why so long to close? Because I think it's by your timetable, it's looking like a 10, 11 months to close compared to, say, four months for CIT. Uh, yeah, no, look, I, I think in any company there's a, a process, a regulatory process, and they operate in a lot of countries um, because they sell to mobile network operators or around the world. And so there's uh, – when you have lots and lots of different geographies, that can sometimes cause a little bit longer time period. Um, but there's nothing, nothing more uh, uh, fancy about it than that. Thank you. The next question is from Scott Graham with Seaport Research. You may go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. I wanted to just understand the uh, nature of the uh, restructuring charge and, you know, maybe the payback on that. And if I could squeeze in a, a second one, uh, Adam, you commented that um, you were seeing some of your automotive manufacturers slowing production. I'm hoping you could uh, elaborate on that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what your what restructuring charge you're talking about. We did talk about a seventy million dollar acquisition related charge, which is acquisition expenses, which includes you know, the money that we pay to various uh, advisors who help us do the deal, together with some amortization of backlog and things like that. This is not a restructuring charge. You, you usually will not hear Amphenol talking about restructuring. Um, relative to auto, I think what I mentioned is that we, we do see, in, in particular, I would say in Europe, um, that you know, some of the demand expectations for our customers uh, going to the third quarter are a little bit more muted. But, you know, our, our guide is, is this is not a severe change in, in the volumes. Um, it's just a very, modest, uh, a, a very modest change here in the third quarter. Thank you. Our next question is from Andrew Buscalia with BNP Paribas. You may go ahead. Hey, guys. I wanted to check on uh, mobile devices. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you said you're guiding that up 20% sequentially. Um, you know, and, and presumably there's some renewed optimism around, um, you know, this being driven by an upgrade cycle of devices. Can you talk about, first off, can you confirm that? And secondly, how do you, in past cycles, tend to participate in um, upgrade cycles if this were to be one, you know, is it, is it earlier on or later on or, or how does that play out in your mind? Yeah, well, thanks very much, Andrew. I mean, look, I think we had a very strong second quarter in mobile devices, much stronger than we anticipated coming into the quarter. Um, and now with a guide of 20% uh, sequential growth on, on a higher than we had anticipated baseline, here in the third quarter. I mean, it's, uh, I think that's a fairly positive view. Um, you know, is that due to upgrade cycles? I mean, yes, I, I guess every year, you know, mobile devices, are, there's new releases. These are very short life cycle products. And so there tend to be new products every year. Whether, you know, there's a more significant upgrade cycle, I, I wouldn't tell you that that's necessarily what, what we're sort of discounting for here. You know, as always, we have a team of folks 
who work in mobile devices who are extraordinarily agile. And we have demonstrated over many, many years of participating in this market that when there are additional sales to be had, when there is kind of more of a, I don't know the term folks use now, super cycle of upgrades, you know, we have always been able to capitalize and get more than our fair share of that. So we'll see what happens here this year. I think this is probably a more kind of a normal outlook that, that we would have. Um, and, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. You know, and, and to your question of when would we or how would we participate, I mean, if people are making more devices, then we'll sell more components to go on those devices. And, you know, when they build those will depend largely on the type of demand that they see from their customers. And, you know, that our, our job is not to anticipate that, but rather to react in real time when, when there are changes in the demand. And if there are favorable changes, we'll manage through that, and I'm sure we'll, we'll do well. And if there are not favorable changes, our team will adjust in real time to preserve the bottom line, and that's how we've always operated. Thank you. Our next question is from Mark Delaney with Goldman Sachs. You may go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking my question. With the CIT transaction and the proposed Andrew deals, both over $2 billion, and I think the largest uh, Amphenol has done in its history, I hope you can help us to better understand if the degree of diligence Amphenol does changes for deals of that size, including as you think about cultural fit, and how you think about the ability and your confidence in getting the margin performance and execution to more typical Amphenol levels over time when taking on these larger businesses. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Mark. I mean, look, you can imagine that we are very serious in both our diligence but also in our interactions with the people. And you know, the bigger the company, the more people you're going to want to interact with. I mean, it's pretty linear from that perspective. And so you know, we had a you know, very, very significant review and diligence with both CIT and, and these businesses from Comscope, which we, which we will just refer to here as Andrew. Um, and, and, and both from a diligence, integrity of the numbers, but also from, uh, from a cultural perspective. I mean, on one side, in terms of integrity, Carlisle and Comscope are both great companies. They're public companies. They report great numbers. So I think, yes, we do enormous financial diligence around them. Um, but I think the starting point is also these are public companies with audited financials from extremely reputable big four audited firms, um, as opposed to sometimes you buy family companies and you almost have to, to sort of do a ground up audit of them and you don't have to do that kind of work here. Um, but the cultural aspects, getting to know the people, understanding are they passionate about becoming part of Amphenol? Do they believe in the business? Do they see uh, uh, the potential are they do they feel even liberated by being part of an interconnect company in 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 the case of CIT or or being able to you know be be a standalone business in in the case of Andrew um, this is really important because we always preserve the management and we're not going to buy a company like this if we hear from the management team that they're not committed to being part of uh, of our company going forward and I can tell you that both inside CIT and Andrew the folks are extremely passionate, extremely excited to be part uh, of the Amphenol organization. Now, relative to margins, I mean, you know, we've been making acquisitions for many, many, many years, as, as you know, Mark. Um, and, and at the end of the day, we don't have just one recipe for how do companies improve their operating margins to bring up to, you know, at or above our corporate average. We believe that there are no sacred cows. Margin is price minus cost. And we seek to expose them to their sister and brother companies around the world so that they can see, you know, some of the ways that other Amphenolians have gone about uh, improving their companies in, in due course. And I, I think both the folks at CIT and, and in Andrew, and they have different levels of profitability, by the way. CIT is, is, is a lower profitability today. Andrew is actually operating at, at really nice levels of profitability um, but we see with both of them long-term great opportunities, both on the top line and on the bottom line. And, and how that's going to happen, you know, the, these are exciting businesses with lots of different inputs and outputs. And I, I'm very confident that, that the team will find a way and we'll, we'll certainly help them do that. Thank you. Our next question is from Will Stein with Truist Securities. You may go ahead. Hey, great. Thanks for taking my question. Um, Adam, congrats on all the 
deals you've announced recently, some really big ones and some storied companies with uh, with Andrew in particular. And it, it sort of um, forces me to wonder um, about management's bandwidth to deal with all these and to potentially continue to look at deals. I know that you've added, a, I, I think, a new layer of management that might have been several years ago to facilitate potentially adding in bigger acquisitions. We're starting to see something like that. Um, but I wonder whether you have the management bandwidth to continue to look at new deals and to do even more, or if perhaps you're going to have to put a pause on deals for a while. Thank you. Well, thank you, Will. I mean, look, you ask a question that is so close to my heart. Uh, and I think I've even used this with you before. You know, I view my job as CEO of Ampinal really twofold, to protect the culture of the company and to scale the company given that culture. And, you know, call it to protect and to scale, not, not, not quite like, you know, the NYPD to protect and to serve. Um, and, and I think we can look back over these last, let's call it 20 years, 25 years even. I've been in the company 26 years. I've been now CEO for 15 and a half of those years. I, I think we've done actually an outstanding job of both of those things. I would tell you that the culture of the company today across our more than 135, I don't know, 137 or so general managers, that Amphenolian culture of entrepreneurship is stronger today than it has ever been before. Is it's embodied across those people, the vibrancy, and the strength of that entrepreneurship is, is, is amazing. I see it all over the world as I travel around to meet with our people. It, it is so unique and so powerful. But at the same time, we have scaled the company. And, and you correctly point out, two and a half years ago, we took a big step in the company's evolution with the creation of three divisions run by division presidents. Um, each of those are reportable segments. But that was a natural evolution that goes all the way back to even the beginning of the 2000s, 2003, when we created our first operating groups, where we had five of those. And that was the first time that general managers didn't just report to our then CEO, who still happens to be our chairman. You know, we have a lot of continuity in Amphenol, uh, as, as you know. Um, and those groups expanded over time to the point where today, we have 15 of these operating groups. You know, these are groups that, you know, are roughly a billion dollars or so on average in, in size. We have the three global divisions, and that has created an enormous bandwidth for us both to pursue organic growth opportunities, which are, which are still very, very critical and really core to the company, but also to continue to expand the range of our acquisition program. And, you know, we've, we've gotten the question over the years, you may have even asked it yourself, Will, you know, as the company grows, um, and if you roughly contribute about a third of your growth over, over the long term from acquisitions, that must mean either you have to do more deals or you have to do bigger deals. And my answer has always been for the last 15 and a half years, yes. Um, some combination of the two we, we will have to do. And I think we can look back and say, yes, we have continued to do that. We have continued to open the aperture of both the number and the scale of the deals that we do. And that is exactly related to that, that scaling up of our organization. You know, it's interesting, though. When you think about most companies and how traditionally they would scale an organization, you would build layers, you would build matrices, you would build really bureaucracies at the end of the day. But that's not what this has happened in Amphenol. In fact, whether it's the divisions or the groups, these are very lean organizations, but they're exactly what our lean headquarters once was before. I mean, if you think about, you know, the, the, when, we, when we had just 15 GMs reporting to the CEO and we would make maybe one acquisition in, in a year or two, and then when we first started our five groups, maybe we'd make three or four. And now here in the last 18 months, We've made, we've closed on 12 acquisitions. We've signed two more, and that's included the two largest in, in, in the company's 92-year history. And, and that is just a reflection of the successful scaling of, of the Amphenol culture. The fact is, is CIT and, and what we will call Andrew are in different divisions. They report to different division presidents. And you can bet that those individuals are working extraordinarily hard on getting to know the companies, doing the diligence like we discussed with Mark's question, and ultimately bringing them successfully into the Amphenol family. 
Um, no doubt about it, we would not have been able to do this if we didn't have, if we hadn't have evolved the organization. But today we have really almost a limitless capability to do that. And, you know, coupled with a balance sheet that is second to none that Craig has been such an amazing steward of. Thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Fox with Fox Advisors. You may go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Um, just one more on Comscope. Can you just talk, Adam, a little bit from a technology standpoint, how you plan on leveraging, um, you know, all the antenna portfolio you will have combined, cable assemblies, connectors, et cetera, um, you know, as part of one big organization. That would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, look, Steve, I think it's early. Um, you know, we've just signed the deal, and we're obviously going to go through a, a regulatory process here. Um, and then once we get through that, you know, we'll, we'll certainly be very thoughtful about, about the company. But what I would say is this. I mean, Amphenol has been in RF connectors from the beginning. I mean, we invented the world's first RF connector back in 1941. Um, Andrew was really the innovator of antenna technology, one of the innovators of antenna technology for mobile networks. And, you know, I think the combination of those two rich legacies ultimately is going to create enormous value for our customers. And, and, and I can tell you, you know, having talked already to a, a, a several of those customers, you know, they, they feel very excited about uh, Amphenol as a home for this important partner for them. Thank you. Our next question is from Joe Giordano with TD Cowan. You may go ahead. Good afternoon, this is Michael. I'm for Joe. Um, so, so previously, you got th thank you. Um, so previously, you guys suggested like AI revenues are probably annualizing around 800 million, um, and, and there's there's probably a path to a billion or so for next year. Um, can you just provide any color on uh, customers like capex ramp required to support this AI growth, and if you could provide any um, you know clarity on how margins compare versus the rest of the portfolio, would would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Again, I, you know, you, we've given, I think, some good directional um, guidance on the scale of this. I talked about the fact that the vast majority of our growth on a year-over-year -year basis is, is really growth in AI. And, you know, by the way, we had some AI already a year ago in the second quarter. Um, I think we talked uh, quite a bit already about uh, the, the order patterns and, and the potential CapEx uh, required for this. I don't really want to repeat myself on that. Um, what I would just say is that, you know, the customers, they want to work with us uh, because of our technology. And, and at the end of the day, these products, these systems have such demands put upon them. The performance levels that they're being run at are so extraordinary that, that it is coming back all the time to do you have the product, number one, and do you have the capacity and the competency to build that product? And that capacity and competency to build is something that we have demonstrated over many, many years, many different revolutions in IT Datacom. But it does require, uh, for sure, us to continue to make investments so that we can support this, this real revolution in, in AI investments. And just from a margin perspective, I, we wouldn't call out any significant difference. Like the AI product line is certainly um, margin accretive, but not so much, not meaningfully different from the rest of the portfolio of products that we have. It's, it's, it's a good business, and we want all the, all of our businesses to continue to grow and, and and you know provide margin contribution, which we expect that will happen. Thank you. And our last question comes from Siri Boroditsky with Jeffries. You may go ahead. Hi. Thanks for bringing us in. Um, just kind of going back to the industrial commentary, you talked about distribution growing meaningfully sequentially. Do you have a sense of underlying demand getting better, or is this just the end of destocking? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Terry. I mean, look, I think the, the end of destocking usually just means that end demand starts to match with the demand put on us by the distributors because it wouldn't be a restocking, if you will. So if you think about how that would normally go, you know, customers start to reduce their demand, uh, distributors are left with too much inventory, they reduce their demand by even more, and then once they get to a level that they feel good about, 
then they try to sort of mirror their end demand with the demand put on us. So I, I don't think that our distributors are necessarily restocking, but probably they're matching what they're seeing. And that, again, that's why I say, you know, without saying that industrial is, you know, sort of booming here, I, I think the early signs of the positive book to bill that we saw together with the, the sequential and, and also somewhat year-over-year -year momentum from distributors is a, is a good and positive early sign for industrial, but we'll see how it goes through the third quarter and through the end of the year. And I'll now turn the call back over to Mr. Norwit for any closing remarks. Well, thank you very much, and we, we truly appreciate everybody's time today. And I do hope that all of you get a little bit of a chance to take some time off uh, this summer, and we look forward to being back with you here in the fall just 90 days from now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for attending today's conference, and have a nice day.